The John Campia Show, in association with Designing Hollywood, presents... Welcome to the Designing Hollywood podcast in association with the John Campia Show. I'm your host, Tess McLeod. This episode is sponsored by Western Costume Company. Thank you so much, WCC. Today's guest is Christine Beeslin Clark, who is a Los Angeles-based costume designer with over 20 years of experience designing for film, television, and theater. Her work on Paramount Plus's Star Trek Picard earned Christine her first Emmy nomination for Outstanding Fantasy Sci-Fi Costumes, as well as a Costume Designers Guild nomination. Huge, huge, huge congrats to you. Those are two giant creds. Um, Her TV credits further include costume designing AMC's Into the Badlands and the TV movie Marvel's Most Wanted. In addition to TV, Christine has served as the costume designer for numerous feature films, including Spy, starring Melissa McCarthy, Jude Law and Jason Statham, an Ender's Game starring Harrison Ford, Viola Davis, Asa Butterfield, and Haley Steinfeld. You've worked with everyone, it seems like. (laughs) (laughs) In 2010, Christine worked alongside Michael Wilkinson as co-costume designer of Disney's Tron Legacy. Their innovative use of technology and costume design garnered them a Costume Designers Guild nomination for excellence in fantasy film. As an assistant costume designer, Christine has worked on notable films such as Disney's live action feature Jungle Cruise starring Dwayne Johnson and Emily Blunt. She's worked on Shall We Dance starring Jennifer Lopez, Zack Snyder's Watchmen, and 300 in Alejandro G. Iñárritu's Babel. Um, She was raised on Long Island, which is very cool. Um, (laughs) Christine's love for the arts began when she saw her first Broadway show at age six, starting them young. I like it. After studying theater arts and costume design in New York, Christine designed costumes for stage, including All in the Timing and Raised in Captivity at the renowned Piccolo Spolito Festival in Charleston, South Carolina. Perceptional observation is an essential tool for character and costume design, and Christine's early preoccupation for people watching has inspired many of her costume designs for both stage and screen. Christine, I'm so excited. Thank you so much for being here today. This is a long waited interview. Everyone's been talking about Picard. You've earned yourself an Emmy nomination, a Costume Designers Guild nomination, and you've worked and been a witness to costume design world since it seems you've been six years old, which is so, so, so impressive. That is a lifelong accomplishment and achievement and I'm so excited to delve into your life and your work on Picard and everything else you've done because it seems like this this is this is who you are um amongst being freaking amazing but this (laughs) is like such a big part of who you are and I'm so excited to get to know you and the thought process behind all of these amazing projects you've worked on um I would love to know how you started in costume design. Was it you were first in fashion? Was it a, you were doing theater as a child? You just really loved going to shows. Um, Sure. How did you, how did you begin? Well, thank you for having me. And thank you, Western Costume Company, my favorite people. Uh Um, (laughs) (laughs) Um, Listen, I mean, you mentioned I grew up on Long Island. uh, So a stone's throw from Broadway. Um, and I mean, I'm the gypsy of my family. Let's be honest Mm. there. I am the wild child (laughs) that went off with the circus. Um, you know, I, my father, firefighter in New York city, my mom's bookkeeper, uh, very much middle-class America, but Mm. a great love of the arts. I mean, particularly my mom, um, Mm -hmm. took me to my first Broadway show at six and it was like this magical world opened to me. I mean, I was always a fan of 
art and artwork and crafts and storytelling and literature. But the second I went to see a live show, the, sort of something switched on. It was like, oh, I'm home. These are my people. Yeah. Um, and actually that show <laughs> was Annie. Um, and the delightful Sarah Jessica Parker was playing Annie in oh that production. My gosh. There is photo evidence of me and my sister Julie just swooning. Um, but it just, it was that moment where I kind of connected some dots of what was of interest to me. Um, I, you know, at six, who knows where that's going to take you. But that started, you know, theater studies in school, high school, on to college. Um, general theater studies. I didn't know what my niche was at that time. You know, we're all actors to begin with, which is terrible. Um, <laughs> oh my gosh. I, you know, my mom will say I was great, but it was, yeah, that was not my place in front of the camera or on the stage. Um, so I went to general studies and stagecraft and lighting. And then I did my costume laboratory and that became just the place where I felt I'd be the best at st at storytelling and part of this mm -hmm. family. Mm -hmm. um, so that start, you know, my education in, in theater arts and then working a lot in stage and for plays. Um, and then I was eventually in Charleston, South Carolina, where yes. and I'm going to be to date myself now. Um, you know, it was, <laughs> it was the mid nineties and that's, you know, before Hollywood was going to Atlanta um, mm -hmm. and Europe and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Louisiana, we were in the the Southeast. So there mm -hmm. were quite a few productions in North and, and South Carolina and a film came to town and somehow I hitched myself to that wagon. <laughs> and um, that was sort of it. I was like, oh, this is a wonderful modern storytelling mode that I want to be a part of. So mm -hmm. a couple of years later, I moved to Los Angeles with very little money. Mm -hmm. and you know that wing in a prayer so yeah that was the beginning yeah wow so you were always interested in crafts and um you were interested in theater and general theater and everything as a child yeah, which really sure. like sprung your love for costume design and getting into um working on film set and then coming to Los Angeles where all dreams definitely come true. Um, well, try. <laughs> yeah, try. <laughs> We're in process still. Like this is definitely still very much in process. Of the dreams coming true. Welcome to La La Land. Yeah. Yes. yes. Um, so that's so fantastic. So it seems like you've had, this has been um, a really big part of your journey is being in this creative environment and, um, when you were a child, did you ever take any sewing classes? Did your um, parents know how to sew? Grandparents, anyone like that? My 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 grandmothers. I mean, I'm sure that they did, but we mm -hmm. sewed together. But my mother actually attended the Fashion Institute um, in New York City. Um, oh, wow! When, yes, when she was a young young woman. So mm -hmm. she, there was always a passion and an interest there with her as well. And I remember looking through, you know, her portfolios and things as a kid. And, mm -hmm. you know, we would do little projects. And, but it wasn't really, I I was 19 years old when I really learned how to sew. Wow. Like really, you know, went into a costume laboratory and theater. And, you know, the 80 something year old Carolyn Arvani uh -huh. taught me how to sew. <laughs> and, you know, we made corsets and, you know, I mean, oh really phenomenal things. So, you know, I had a lot of training and background in construction, pattern making. I did a lot of summer stock theater where I mm. was building costumes before mm -hmm. I was designing them, which I think is a great, I mean, it's just a wonderful way to really understand your language. You know, yeah. we are a village. It is quite a community that, that creates the show. So to be able to articulate and understand how to act your designs I think mm -hmm. is is an incredible tool and that was really honed in that in that early part of things for me wow that's great did you ever work in any um did you ever want to did you know that you were going to go from like did you go from costumer to assistant costume designer to costume designer like what was your path yeah like? I mean it's I kind of you know I climbed up the the you know the ladder in theater mm -hmm. so I you know I was sewing I was a stitcher I was a first hand mm -hmm. I was a draper I was you know I did one crew backstage wearing my favorite mm -hmm. color black of course. um 
<laughs> uh, so I kind of did all that and I was a shop manager and then designer wow. in theater and then kind of rebooted the whole thing um mm-hmm. in when I started film work I was a PA I mean I mm-hmm. started you know, just running around picking up dry cleaning and absorbing whatever I could yeah um and then also I mean I early early on in my career in Los Angeles I mean I was doing alterations for the Drew Carey wow. show you know like oh, I, wow. <laughs> I really kind of just started the whole process over um and then when in you know I was a customer I was a set customer and a costume supervisor for a bit and then mm-hmm. a long history of assisting other designers mm-hmm. and really getting to understand the craft from that perspective of the design yeah. mind yeah yeah Do you think that doing all these different occupations within the theater and film and TV world, it really made you understand how the entire industry works? Because I know some people go from absolutely like, yeah, because some people go from like fashion school or theater school to like styling to costume design. Um, But it's really fascinating that you went, that you seems like you've done a ton of work within costume departments um, and theater departments and everything. So you act, so you got to have an entire knowledge yeah. and database of every single job, which probably does that make it easier to communicate with people within the department? Totally. Absolutely. I think it's, you know, we talk about language and there is design language and, you know, there's, there's elements of design that are the language of communication with other designers, Mm -hmm. but then you come into your workroom and you go onto your set and you, you have to be able to understand and articulate to everyone in every facet of your department. I mean, in, 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 Picard, we had a team of over 36 at, at certain times. Wow. And, you know, age or dyers, textile artists, cutter fingers, pattern makers, you know, people who are shopping, pulling by, like everybody has a little piece of the mm-hmm. puzzle. Um, and the more that you know and understand, it's like, you know, it's as if I took Italian and I, I skipped 101 and 102 and I went, right. you know, the more yeah. that you understand the premise of it, I think the better you are um, in your expectations of what's achievable because you mm-hmm. understand timeline and, and then just to convey how you want the vision to be in a way that's yeah. relatable to whomever you're trying to give direction to. Right. And probably with the background in stitching and alterations, you can understand what can um, logically get done within your time frame instead of wanting to maybe. Um, to an extent, like, because as yeah. a designer, you always want the sun and the moon and the stars. But totally, find, of course. You know, when I go into a fitting room with actors and I go in with our costume makers, I think I. And I do think that they appreciate my ability to communicate clearly in Mm -hmm. context of, but I also have a great respect for that. Um, My knowledge is like entry level, you know, they're the artisans and the experts and the maestros and the experts in their piece of, of the pie. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I can express and communicate in, in, you know, preliminary language Um, and then they, but then they can really take it and run with it and make it excellent. Wow, that's so, so interesting. I I love how you've had like this giant foundation, this huge pedigree of everything you've learned over the last, um, like however many years you've been doing this, like we're going to say we can put a two on it, but it's more, it's about 30 (laughs) years. Yeah. Wow. It's about 30 years of, you know, and kind of a cycle of about 10 years in theater and then, uh, you know, about 20 in film and television so far. So yeah. Is there a project that you've worked on that really made you think, wow, I, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. Was that your first project? Wow. You know? Hmm. I mean, I was smitten from Uh entry level. I mean, you could put me in the worst workspace with like a, like a little table with a bad folding chair and I'd be like, I'm in. I think for (laughs) me the you know, the attraction of what we're doing is, you know, we're, this is the Shakespeare of our time. You know, mm-hmm. this is the medium of storytelling. You know, if we go back to, you know, ancient history of fireside and storytelling and myths and, and the way that that's come up through history and Shakespeare and the plays of the people, this is of the people. This is everybody's watching television and film mm-hmm. across the globe. And yeah. we have an opportunity to express and communicate and connect and, you know, just 
enhance everyone's human experience through our storytelling. And um, for me, this is just an opportunity to participate in that to the best of my ability. Mm -hmm. And you've worked with some of Hollywood's biggest stars, Melissa McCarthy, Dwayne Johnson, so many, so many, so many people. Um, What was it like to start working with some of these big actors? You know, it's, I feel like my assistant design career really, really helped me with that footing. I, you Mm -hmm. know, I spent about nine years working for other designers um, and learning so much of their skills and, and how you communicate in that regard in the collaboration with the actor, director, Mm -hmm. and, you know, producers and all the people Mm -hmm. who are part of the creative machine, but very specifically the the sanctuary of costume fitting space with an actor and the costume designer is just such a unique place to be and so much respect goes into that place. and I learned you know working with Michael Wilkinson for years um Sophie Durakoff um just watching their tremendous ability to communicate and collaborate it just mm-hmm. took that oh, like freak out moment that I might have had as a designer yeah 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 (laughs) because you're you're in proximity to it for so long and you know you're right there with them Mm -hmm. so yes the first time in films with big stars was it's very intimidating because you want to be as excellent as they are you want to offer them as as you've seen them offer on the screen um but I was always over here you know with a notepad so it wasn't Uh me I was watching somebody else so by the time I came for me to be in that driver's seat I felt pretty grounded in my Mm -hmm. my own abilities in that way right and you had like the experience and you got to watch other people do it yes so you could do it yourself I did not go immediately into the deep end of the pool I slowly went it walked walked through there (laughs) so I felt like when I got there I'm like okay I I can do this yeah. Deep breath. Mm-hmm. I can go. Mm-hmm. I can do it. <laughs> yes. That's so, 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 so cool. Um, so many films that you've worked on have inspired so many people. Um, and people go to them for comfort or laughs or everything. You know, you worked on an amalgamation of genres. Is there a certain genre that you like working with or working on the best or just watching the best? It's uh I don't think that what appeals to me and rings true is genre specific. Mm-hmm. I really feel like, you know, any any storytelling, and I mean, I think we're all fans of all things for d- at different points in life and for different moments. Yeah. You know, sometimes you really just want to go on a fun ride and like go on a spy movie with one yeah. and just have a really good time. Yeah. Um, and other times you're looking for, you know, answers to questions or re- a relatable experience that mm. be challenging. So mm-hmm. I think, you know, for me, it doesn't matter the genre if if there's something compelling in the storytelling on whatever level that is. And sometimes it's just pure entertainment and having like a great time in the movies. Yeah. Um, and other times it's really, you know, looking at a historical moment in time really has a strong point of view that's relatable to current day politics mm-hmm. you know, there's all kinds of reasons but I always feel like the gravitational pull for me is the story and the premise of it mm. um okay. more so than the genre oh okay that's really cool so it's not like there's a specific genre like um sci-fi or romance that you like gravitate towards it's more based no. on what the story is and your absolutely like what tugs at your heartstrings very much. I think that, you know, eventually you develop skill sets inside genres, you know, science fiction mm-hmm. and world building is extremely complex and in costume making Definitely. and the skill set that's required to tell story in that world building mode. Um, you know, there's there's not very many of us that have been challenged in, in that broad of a way. And yeah. so you do become, you know, the science fiction costume just because you have the skill set to offer to right. that that's that's trusted and proven yeah and it's so complicated making all of these like science fiction you know specific superhero type of costumes like it's a whole it seems like a whole it's different a whole other ball thing. game you know <laughs> so that yeah. would I would love to start talking about that with your sure. work on Picard so I've noticed with Picard it has been you know talked about everywhere it seems like every time I look at something there, there's something about Picard, which is huge. You know, you did that. That's 
fantastic. And, Aww. um, <laughs> and was it, did you feel nerve, um, were you, was it nerve wracking starting on such a large project, um, like Star Trek, you know, because it's been yeah. going on for decades. How did you prepare for that role as costume designer on such a huge movie with such a giant fan base mm. to make it true to um, the director and the fans? You know, was that was that scary for you? I think, you know, there's a tremendous burden of responsibility to uh, regard and respect the history of what you're walking into, you know, Definitely. the history of the costumes, the characters, mm -hmm. what Star Trek means to the world, to the fan base, you know, the, the, the road that has been paved that you're stepping onto long and very highly regarded. And mm -hmm. so, yes, there is, I, I don't think I'm, I was scared as much mm -hmm. as I was very aware of that yeah. responsibility and wanting to do the best I possibly can to offer something in that vein of history in, mm -hmm. in the Star Trek franchise mm -hmm. that was reverent and correct contextually. I mean, you want to, you have to do a lot of research in Star oh, Trek yeah, to, ca I bet. to catch up. I mean, you know, I mean, we've seen the content, but, you know, to really understand and know what choices that you're making, there's so much history yeah. there. So there was a lot of reading. A lot of yeah, a lot of mm -hmm. you know, yeah, going back, you know, and just seeing where, and also like the crazy thing about Star Trek is that aired in this timeline or or in the eighties, but the timeline inside Star Trek is different. So we had right. this like this enormous lineup on the wall of like you know, even if it was one of the JJ films that was in the two thousands, where does mm -hmm. it take place in the timeline of the history of Trek? Right. So you're, you're really building this archive and knowledge database of, mm. of the visuals that have been preceded you so that you can use them as a jumping off point, as inspiration and as context. Yeah. yeah. So there's, there's a lot of responsibility in that and, mm -hmm. and that's not lost on me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's such a huge undertaking, this entire Star Trek universe, yeah. Was that, did you watch Star Trek as a kid? Did you, um, were you really interested in Star Trek before you were signed on to do um, the costume designing for Picard? I would say, I mean, I feel like most people, I had a strong awareness of Trek and, and I had, I didn't have the deep dive into it that a lot mm -hmm. of the fan base really does, but I had enough of an experience with it to know what I was coming to, sure. Um, you know, I, I watched the original series uh -huh. reruns when I was a kid <laughs> with my dad. And, you know, I had a very keen understanding of TNG and, and the films. Um, but that was very, I mean, to me, that's tertiary. That's very peripheral mm -hmm. to what you need to know to really yeah. to go and take legacy characters and bring them into a new context. So, yeah. I had an experience I think we all do to a certain extent and I had a great yeah. regard and um respect for you know our first interaction our course. you know just the just what is Star Trek to our culture um mm -hmm. and then just wanting to bring what I could to that yes yeah. I had an experience with Star Trek Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and it seems like you really stayed true to all the characters and it seems like that was really important and every single choice seemed super deliberate, which was fascinating and so exciting to watch because it didn't seem like anything was not completely thought out. It seemed every color, every, you know, every single thread and buckle or everything was like really, really, really deliberate. Well, I so appreciate you saying mm -hmm. that because it really was <laughs> the, yeah. the, the mental energy that goes into every single decision yeah it is something so thank you yeah. for acknowledging of course that. <laughs> and like down to like the last eyelet or you know I would love to know how all of these knitwears came about did you 3d print knitwear did you mm -hmm. source knit was it all from where did you get this 
knitwear like the every everything looked yeah. perfect like no thread seemed out of place <laughs> it's so interesting because it you know when we came to Picard in season one uh-huh. it was a very different telling of a really really loved character I mean Jean-Luc Picard is mm-hmm. there there are wars that go on amongst the fan base of who is the best captain yes <laughs> I yes mean, <laughs> You, you kind of only have two choices when it comes mm-hmm. down to it. There are people who would say three, but um, <laughs> he's so loved, but we hadn't seen him in quite some time. You know, there time had passed and he was retired. So mm-hmm. we're coming to the story in a very, very different way. And how can we lend ourselves to that visual, visually while still remaining true to who Jean is? So right. knitwear became a way of, you know, first of all, the character of Jean-Luc has a lot of, of interest, historical artifact. Mm-hmm. So, you know, for instance, in a world of digitized everything, he still has a library of paper books. You know, this right. the character yeah. enjoys artifact. Mm-hmm. And so when looking in the realm of costume and clothing and clothing choices one might make, to go into the history of where just seemed like an appropriate thing for the character to do, like right. uh, just out mm-hmm. of interest, self-interest. But yeah. then also gave us texture and softness and interest and a color palette that could take us places where we hadn't been with mm-hmm. Picard. Um, right. And so that became really a springboard in season one. And then we took that into season two in a very different way. So in season one, we ha- we hand knitted um, or machine and hand knitted. Uh, Maria Ficalora did some really beautiful wow. things for us in New York and um yeah, and we had very little time. So it was, mm-hmm. it was a jam and everybody made it happen. <gasps> Italian wools coming in overnight. Yeah, it was crazy. Oh my gosh, it was wools up the wazoo. Yeah. Yes. Um, and then um, in season two, for mm-hmm. episode one specifically, we wanted to have that connective tissue to the previous season and the character as we knew before we went right. off on this very different turn into things. Yeah. So the knitwear did come back, but we did 3D knit in season two um oh with gosh. the delightful joe siegel who did magical things holy um, cow no, with no time but again going to beautiful rich color palette into those olives and warm tones yes but taking that knitwear into a little bit more of a meticulous kind mm-hmm. of sci-fi way so it's still there and there's a through line but in just a slightly more sophisticated edgy yeah. textural way yeah and how did you come up with the color palette because it seems like with Picard, you want him, you you want him to. It, we want him to be our hero, right? And it's yeah. like we want to also show that he um, struggles with humanity and that he can be vulnerable. What was it like choosing your color palette for him right. specifically? Color is such a wonderful tool for a designer. It's mm-hmm. just you know the the psychology of color and the way that we can you know, sort of manipulate the emotions of of the Mm -hmm. audience in reacting to the visuals. There's just such a really strong factor in that. And I think in, you know, particularly in season one, we chose an autumnal palette. Um, Mm -hmm. Hanalee Culper was our director of that first episode of of season one and, you know, really wanted to create something warm and charming Mm -hmm. and enduring and something that felt like homey in a way you know we started out at the chateau and we wanted to be in a place that felt like somewhere that we wanted to be so that we could Mm -hmm. miss it when we left right um and very different from being you know on a ship with sleek lines and lots of you know it was really warm and wood and stone and Mm -hmm. and for us you know the complement to that with the colors is you know tweeds and textures and linens and 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 knitwear um, and keeping in this really rich, warm, beautiful autumn palette that's very mm-hmm. different from what we've seen before. And we right. go into space and 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 spin it around. Yeah. Um, so we definitely took that as you know Jean Luc's palette remains the same into season two. You know we go back to the chateau again and it's very much still there and the color mm-hmm. choices are quite similar um, until we get into space and then just took the color out of everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, speaking of season two, the Starfleet yeah. uniforms, I would love to know about the Starfleet uniforms and, you know, maybe it's homage to the Starfleet past. Um, what was it like yes. designing those uniforms? 
Well, I mean, truly, you know, if there's a place where you feel the burden of responsibility, I shouldn't mm. say burden. I'll just that I feel indebted to that. I feel yeah, that, of course, you know, the history of Trek is so connected to those visuals um, and, you know, amazing designers that have have created them. I mean, it, you, you want respect for everything that was paid, but also mm. context and then continuity and continuing the line and where you're taking it to. Right. Um, so, you know, very much regarding the palette that has been Starfleet, you know, black with our mm -hmm. division colors. And, yes. you know, we have our bird and our golds and the beautiful turquoise kind of teal mm -hmm. blue. Um, I, to, to change any of that would be insanity. And I, mm. I why would you do that? Right. So right. we kept all of that in line and I, our, our season one Starfleet uniforms were, and me and everyone will say this, we were done in a bit of haste. Mm. Um, and so when we got the chance to come back for season two, um, our showrunners, Akiva Goldsman and Terry Metalis, we all kind of, you know, mind melded, <laughs> to use a term, um, had a conversation of what we wanted to shift and, and do better. Um, and that became more inspired by Wrath of Khan kind of stylelines of asymmetry, mm. keeping things a little sleeker, a little closer yeah. to the frame, but and then using just wonderful piping, perfect details. But we yes. kept, kept the delta print, we kept the yokes. So there are things that we kept in context to our own work, and then also in regard to the history of Starfleet uniforms. But I literally had a timeline up in my office that went like around the whole space oh my of gosh. like the illustrations and green grabs and pictures of Starfleet uniforms in order of, you know, the timeline of Starfleet right. and leading up into our, it's just a wonderful way to kind of keep telling the story with context mm -hmm. yeah um, and stay and i think they're the beautiful story, of course yeah mm -hmm. and they yeah you know i rio ends up wearing one for quite quite a lot of season two and i mean i just think that we kept reverence for starfleet in the historical context but we did our mm -hmm. own thing with it at the same time mm -hmm. and i think it, it was a really nice meld yeah and i think that every starfleet uniform has its own story you know everything has its own um like for season one, season two, they all have their own story. They have their own script. And it's like, I think that you can tell there is a through line between every type of uniform yeah. and um, yours, since it is like the most current, um, it's like this beautiful culmination of all of the other ones combined that really stays true to the characters as well, which is just really lovely to watch if you are a, uh, you know, Star Trek fan. It's great. And yeah. And it's so, it seems really complicated, just the making manpower and mm -hmm. all of the minds going into these uniforms. Cause that's how you I can mean, tell the you, character, you know? Yeah. I mean, if you even took talk. a little list of how many people went into just the design process, but then the actual manufacturing, I mean, turn right. on our dyer, like hand dyed every piece of yoke uh -huh. fabric to be perfectly matched to a Pantone color. The wonderful Karen at By Design did all our dimensional ink printing. You know, our in-house team, like a Sloan and his team and tailoring just like to the eighth of an inch. I mean, it's just, mm -hmm. it's a labor of love, but I feel that everyone who was involved from beginning to end really was there out of love. Yeah. And I hope that that shows. And I think the fans it enjoy does. that. Yeah. Did you have to create a lot of uniforms for like doubles for stunts? Did you have to create like dozens of uniforms? What was it like yes. doing background with these uniforms? Because yeah. everything was so tailored to a T. It was like, it was like, of course it was made for each individual person. What was it like doing background for that? It it's complicated. Let's just, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll be very pleasant and say it's complicated. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, no, it's, you, <laughs> like any you know Starfleet isn't military it's you know exploratory but it does mm. have a lot of the same bones to it a military organization right. would have and in their uniform order and their ranking system I think you know we in our own country and also internationally mm -hmm. have language in uniform making and so we had that as well and so we had a beat sheet of you know the point you know the 
hemline needs to hit here on the sleeve wow. and this needs to, you know, everything had a place where it needed to land on the body. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, Beryl Brackman, our, cost, our background costume coordinator, was working with uh, Amy Arnold and Corey Bronson and doing all these fittings. And we brought a special tailor, Galena, just to make sure everything was hitting where oh it had to go. And because of the complexity of the design, it was it was not an easy challenge. And they oh. worked very, very hard to make sure that when we got up onto that stargazer and we had a group of folks and stories, that every background, every stunt looked as sharp in their uniform as our principals. Yeah, definitely. And you can definitely see that because nobody looks out of place. Nobody looks like nothing looks um, messy sloppy. or dirty. There's or no yes. sloppy. We don't do no. sloppy and start. No, obviously <laughs> not. It's like these, and it's so cool because these characters, um, it seems like every moment and every action is precise with these characters. And these costumes really reflect, like, reflect that. So it really like brings their inside out and shows that this is, that it's technical and these costumes are technical. Um, and it's really, they are really, uniform. really cool. They are, ready they are to go. uniform. Mm -hmm. Well, they are ready I went to and visited go. them. I went and visited them last week in the archives. So they're they're there. There's racks and racks of them. Oh my gosh. We'll, that'd be, so, we'll that'd see be someone's dream. Holds, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Stay tuned. Yes. <laughs> That's so cool. So with other characters, particularly like Seven of Nine. So Jerry Ryan, who plays Seven of Nine and has played Seven of Nine for decades. Um, yes. What was it like designing her costume in, you know, as a nod to the Star Trek Voyager shape? Yeah. Um, what was it like with the tailoring? Was it dyed? Uh, what was it like tackling her costume? You know, it's, I feel like the, first of all, I cannot say enough uh, about my love and admiration for Jerry Ryan and mm -hmm. for the character of Seven of Nine. I really, I, I think as a female in Star Trek, um, this, this is our contemporary our contemporary year really yeah I, this right. is um and the respect that was there I also think you know you have to look at we're world building and so the year is 2400 but we were worlding in the 80s and the 90s and then also in 2020 mm. so you're influenced by the times as well you know not just the context of Star Trek but also our, our current political persuasions our socio uh, social standings. So a lot of the, the female standing in our world has changed quite a bit since mm -hmm. the first time that we saw Seven of Nine on camera and right. the time that we returned to her legacy character. And I felt a lot of, um, I mean, I was excited about taking a character and and focusing her strengths visually in a very different way. Um, mm -hmm. So when Jerry came back to us, you know, she's a Fenris Ranger, like the Fenris Rangers are, you know, the Robin Hoods of the galaxy, right. and she's leading, you know, to, and, and basically on a humanitarian mission the entire time, but as a mm -hmm. warrior. Um, and so the, the form and the shapes of the 80s and 90s become a much different thing. So for us, we that you know all the texture and grit and knitwear mm -hmm. and everything of season one and very much stayed true to her form and her silhouette but in a way of regarding her physical strength in the mission and place that she was in her life at that time and I think that very much carried with us into season two you know when we yeah. first get back on on she now has La Serena she has Rhea's ship and you know she's using that for her Fenris Ranger ex expedition <laughs> um so we we darkened her up a little bit more made it a little bit grittier but still mm -hmm. very much in context what we had done and the history of the character and I think it's probably one of the most well-received characters um, definitely in you know a returning legacy character as far as the you know my part of it the visuals I think people were really thrilled especially the female audience to see a different take on a character that we love so so much yeah definitely that's so cool did you um take a lot of inspiration from the original Star Trek or other Star Trek um shows or uh, anything like I that? would say we you know we respect for the silhouette because I think it's very mm -hmm. much true to seven of nine and you know her assimilation and her storyline 
And so things were fitted, but Mm -hmm. function was so much more important. Right. You know, your power and your movement and your ability to be a physical presence um, and, you know, advocating for others who, Mm -hmm. who maybe need your help. So I think we had, we had context, but we really steered it in a much more modern take. Right. Um, and Jer- Jerry was thrilled. Jerry was like, oh, I bet. so ready to go out there and just be a badass. And, yeah. You know, she was like, I'm going to go out there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember we had this little tiny fitting room in season one. I mean, it was so small. It was like a post stamp. Um, and uh, Freights, Jonathan Freights was directing that episode when we did, you know, debuted mm-hmm. seven. He came over and he, you know, knocked on the door to say hi to Jerry and she was wearing what we felt we was the best look. And it was like, it was a moment. Uh-huh. I could get a little jammed up talking about it right now, yeah. but he was thrilled. And he just said to me, you know, he was so lovely and respectful and kind and just like, this is it, you know, mm-hmm. this is, this is, this is seven. Yeah. Well, I, I wonder what it's like in the fittings because, you know, these characters, you want them to feel powerful. Yeah. You want them to feel powerful. It's like, When I wake up in the morning, I go into my wardrobe and I want to know like what I'm going to put on. You have to go and delve into Mm -hmm. the the, the minds of the characters. And you also have to be careful. You know, you want to not give too much away or you don't want to, you know, you know, you want to be really true to the character. It is. And I think, you know, no matter what you're designing um, as a costume designer, you're always asked those questions like, Mm -hmm what am what am I wearing and why am I wearing it you know right. it, I, I think the thought processes of all of us in, in what we care to wear or you know it, how much thought is going into that where you're going with this what you need mm-hmm. to be doing in these clothes we all make those choices every day and as a designer mm-hmm. you're thinking from that point of view of the choices that the the character is making mm-hmm. um and in context of the journey of the script of where are we go? You know, are we doing big stunts in this? Are we? What are? Where, right. where do we end up with this costume? And especially as a through line for many episodes, um, you know, you you have to think all of that through. And then also, what do I want to tell the audience? And what do mm-hmm. I not want to tell? The audience? Yeah, you know, exactly. what's what's hiding under here that we'll tell you later. So mm-hmm. there's a lot of questions and answers that go into just one single costume and the choices yeah. that are made. Yeah. Did you work with anyone, any uh, departments really, you've probably worked with every single department closely, but was there a specific department, whether it be makeup, you know, I know with Borg Queen, you worked Mm -hmm. with um, creature designer, uh, Neville Page, you know, and there are just like prosthetics and everything. What was it like working on a, you know, on Borg Queen? Mm -hmm. It's, um, I mean, what we do is a collaborative art form. I mean, mm-hmm. it really is, you know, the, our production designer is, you know, that's like the marriage, right? So the yeah. <laughs> two, you're on par through this whole process of design, you know, the world and those that inhabit it. Um, mm-hmm. But hair makeup, I mean, that's your character building head to toe. So our relationship and our collaboration is tremendous, you know, and yeah. then with the actor as well, so whoever is performing and you have this head to toe creation. So it becomes sort of like a, a, we become this little family of, mm-hmm. you know, our hair, you know, with someone like seven, you know, Sylvie Knight, our, our makeup department head, just, just even the tiniest details of what color we're going to, when we put her in this gown, like all that stuff is the collaboration of what we do. Um, yeah. But when you get to something like Borg Queen, which is, you know, a full prosthetic design that yes. has to not only be cohesive in the look head to toe um but function well you know Mm -hmm. where do you bring your prosthetic below uh even just like the on the day how do what process go do we put this on before we go into the chair and then we're two hours later we're going to do this so there's technical collaboration but there's a you know i mean neville's design work is so gorgeous of this Mm -hmm. i mean talk about the history of the board queen and you know the last time we really saw a queen in in this uh, stage it was so different and yeah. our audience wants to see some 
more sophisticated than that now mm -hmm. and everything's high definition and every tiny detail is going to be dissected and so the craft and the design is impeccable i mean his mm -hmm. his work is beautiful but the execution of that you know when you have vincent van dyke's company that designing all the prosthetics and how and james mckinnon and his whole team and just the right. perfect color palettes and the shade and shadow and what colors we're going to be putting into the costume and following the back of the spine down into the costume component. I mean, the, the collaboration is stellar. And, you know, our key specialty costume person, um, Jarothy Bulek Erickson, I, I wanted to kind of move her into Vince Dyke's mm. studio because of how much collaboration went on. Totally, you. yeah. And then you bring in your actor, you know, so Annie Wershon comes in and, you know, Neville would be there We and all of us collaborating. So it's, I mean, it is a family, it is a dance, and it mm -hmm. is very, very, it. but I have to say, it was at times quite painful, just because you, you're, you're striving for an excellence that feature right. film in a TV mm -hmm. timeline. And yeah. that's daunting, but we, mm -hmm. we also don't want to downgrade ourselves. So we were shooting for right. the moon. And I really feel like in the end, what we see and what was achieved is, is just, it's super. I'm so proud of it. Yeah. Well, I think that it really shows how much work and collaboration and it's so insanely cohesive um, and everything looks picture, you know, TV film status. Perfect. Um, such a huge, huge, huge congratulations to. A Thank you. It really was a labor of love. Yeah. Um, it's rumored that there are over 300 pattern pieces that were incorporated to the costume. Is that true? And that the more. leather pieces, I mean, you know, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, when we first see the board queen, she's only like, you know, part of a board queen because mm -hmm. she's in right. a stasis tube. Uh, so that's like just a shorter corset. But I mean, Dorothy, I cannot say enough about the engineering and the craftspeople involved in this. You know, we had concept artist Omario Cecilia was working with us, textile artist Ivory Stanton, like designing every layer of fabric for that. So even base layer of fabric is like three printing processes and boiling mm. and but the engineering of even how to get an arm to articulate mm. or you know, the the armadillo effect of where does it mm -hmm. all go when you move yeah. um you know Dorothy has worked for years and years with marble she's an innovator but her ability to get those so yeah 300 and something pieces just to go into this tiny little part oh of the body gosh. and then we did the full length version so she would have to check us and tell us how many pieces are in that full length one but yeah it's I, every tiny element is flange and a movement and an interlock and it has to work well on the day for all of the physicality mm -hmm. of it right but still being perfect and true to this beautiful creature design wow that is fascinating I feel like you can tell there's a lot of work put into the to the yeah. costume and, and hair, makeup and creature, you know, prosthetics, everything. Mm -hmm. But actually hearing you explain the giant labor of love yeah. and man hours that went into this is incredible. I you mean, know, Annie but... can tell you how many times she came into that fitting room. <laughs> it was a lot. I mean, you're just starting with a base layer. Like the very first thing is like get a bodysuit on the body and make sure it fits you perfectly and then move right. on to the corset and then the next fitting, we're going to do the arms and then we're going to do mm -hmm. everything builds upon, builds upon, but it's, it's yeah. thousands of hours, thousands. Oh, I bet. And speaking of builds upon, so Gerardi's red dress and the fantabulous, you know, silhouette <laughs> and <laughs> the geometry that went into that in comparison to Borg Queen's costume. What was right. it like tackling um, Gerardi's red dress? It's such a, you know, we went so many places in season two, you know, we started mm -hmm. out in our world that we had already created. We flipped that on and, down and went into this, you know, all timeline wake up world. Then we yeah. time traveled and then we're in Los Angeles. I mean, we just sort of did everything. Everywhere. It was like uh -huh. sci-fi, all timeline sci-fi. And now we're, let's go contemporary and have some fun. Definitely. Um, so, I mean, Gerardi's dress, it was, again, it goes back to what I was saying before is like, what do you want to tell the audience and what do you mm -hmm. not want to tell them? Yeah. And so the first time that we see her, you know, they're all, they're infiltrating. So this is a spot, right? We're going into this gala and we have to look like everybody else there. So 
you got to get a dress on. Mm-hmm. But Gerardi is so quirky and wonderful and strange in, her, you know, and the choices that she would make, but she's still a beautiful woman. Yes. Um, and so you get all of that into this dress of like, you know, sort of this 1950s inspired, a little bit of an on pure waist. But, you know, I mean, there was some boom shakalaka going on too. Like she was oh, yeah. gorgeous. gorgeous. And she does this grand, you know, the board queen sort of taking over and she gives this beautiful performance. Thousand pill, hands down. Uh, yeah. Just so you start with that, but we know where it's going. Like I knew how many we were going to assimilate into a board queen throughout mm-hmm. the context of wearing this red dress, and you go on this journey of like battery eating and like you know, <laughs> it's just bizarre. So we tried to build a narrative for that, mm-hmm. and one of the things in that dress, which I just to this day so much is there's a beautiful print that's in the layers of the skirt that mm. is inspired by line language that is in our board queen costume that wow. eventually embodies and it's just this beautiful red foil and ivory stanton worked with our concept artist amario and they created this uh on Ringhoff, and we laser cut it and printed it and foiled it and we oh, made you know there gosh. were like just a million dresses by the end because of the stunts and the multiples <laughs> totally as she's going through this metamorphosis from this grand stage performance um into her assimilation it's we're stripping layers and we're peeling back and things are getting tattered and she's losing an arm and mm-hmm. that texture and that that pattern floats surface and then eventually leads us into when we see her totally transform into that board queen look. Oh so that's gosh. the fun stuff. It's like, oh. I know that's there. You all just see it as like a little sparkly, beautiful dress when she's mm-hmm. singing her song. But we know what we're going to give to you in a minute. So yeah. it's just fun. It's really fun oh. for us. It's so cool. And all the layers and the red is such a beautiful red. It's 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 not you know, stop sign. It's, it's just this gorgeous, like that deep, rich, raspberry. Yes. And all the lipsticks that were tested. Oh, I bet. Kudos. (laughs) Like good job, people. (laughs) Team effort. Yes. Magical. (laughs) So when, um, speaking of other, and blue, when Q returns, um, and you change his costume color from black to midnight blue. Yeah. What was that like? And you used a symmetry and high collar lines to evoke sophistication. What was that like? To, uh, I mean, this is his costume. Cute again, legacy characters. It's mm-hmm. you really have to go to school and go yeah. in there and really look at the history of that character. And Q has a very interesting kind of quirky fun side him but it's also you know he's a puppeteer he's Uh he's you know manipulative and there's all these things that are going on and reasons behind it so yeah he's cheeky and he kind of dresses up and shows up at little times but there's a very strong presence there and Mm. that's the part of all season that's the cue that was coming to us Mm. um so I think one of the most iconic looks for him was the judge's robe that he wore mm. in TNG, which is yeah. this big black, you know, with a wimple and a hat and this enormous necklace. And I think that's very iconic imagery and that we wanted to connect to that in a lot of ways, but modernize it and bring mm. him into the story we were telling. So the midnight blue became for me a color palette through line for him because we were going to have to take him into contemporary lines as well. He was coming as Q in, you know, Wake Up World 2400, mm-hmm. but we were also going to contemporize him. And it just became a really beautiful color for him as a person. But that blend of dark and light, you know, it's mm-hmm. black, but it's not. It's, yeah. are you our friend or you our foe? And right. I, I think we question that as we go through the season. And it became a really great color choice for him. Yeah. Um, and then the satins and the grand collar uh, and there's something operatic and elegant about it. And it's so impactful on the first time that you see him. And I think mm-hmm. it had just great reverence to what we knew, but a really fresh and beautiful take on it. And yeah. John Delancey is a, just a wonderful human and really it just gave him a feeling for mm-hmm. it. And that for us, you know, was amazing um mm-hmm. michael sloan was our tailor on that and just every wow. detail is like mm-hmm. perfect hit it out of the park yeah 
Thank you for letting me use wool satin, <laughs> double face satin, Michael. <laughs> it's like did not go unnoticed. We mm-hmm. loved it. Thank you. We loved it. Yes. And again, there's little details like we see him with a jewelry piece, a brooch has also connectivity to some of the design lines of mm-hmm. his grand necklaces from from past, but we modernized that and took the colors. You know, so there's always a connection, but a yeah. little dialing up. Yeah. And it seems like, you know, there is Easter eggs with like the brooch and yeah. everything like that. Was that of course it was intentional because it seems like everything you did was so intentional, which is what makes it so why gorgeous. Yes. That's why I don't <laughs> <laughs> You're like, I haven't slept in years. 30 years. No. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's all very, very, very thoughtful. Mm-hmm. And then with the brooch, was that 3D printed? Was it made, you know, in hat? Like, what was that? What was the process on the yeah, brooch? Yeah, it's, um, uh, again, my right hand guy, Amario, was our concept artist, illustrator, but also really helped me develop patterns and prints that went into our textile lines um and yes uh designed that we had multiple designs and that was what we all landed on and mm-hmm. then that was 3d printed um and put together um on site with the jewels and painted to the perfect colors and yeah, yeah i mean technology is our friend and it really helps us expedite and be meticulous about things um mm-hmm. and if you know how to use it well and wisely it can really give you those perfect details Definitely. And it's like all those details create such a gorgeous and thought, like a well, very well thought out costume, um, which stays true to the character, the story, everything. Um, I feel like I've learned so much today about Star Trek, about you, about Picard, and I cannot wait um, to see what you do next. I appreciate, yes, I appreciate your time talking about you and Picard and all of like the amazing of people that you shout out working with, which is just fantastic. Love. You did that too. Love my crew. Um, yeah, it seems like you had a top notch team um, who really respected each other, which is so 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 great. Um, so I really appreciate your time, and our viewers would love to know what if you have any advice for them on how to get into costume design. What really worked for you? Do you have any advice for our viewers? Well, thank you. I mean, really, thank you for noticing all and and acknowledging just the levels of work that go into this. We really love it as a community. It, it's our pleasure to bring joy to the audience in whatever way that we can. Yes. Um, for me, I mean, I hope uh, we'll see what you get to see next, but um, mm-hmm. I'm hopeful to explore some other time periods. I think as a designer, um, you know, storytelling is, is the Mecca and whatever period that is in is where we go. But I would love to do something historical and have Mm -hmm. context and, and go into a time period, you know, that that's important to me and emotional and sentimental. Yeah, that'd be really great. And then you could, that's like a whole other field. You could just be good at every single one. (laughs) I'm ready. I'm just getting started. Get in there. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, I'm so excited to see what you do next. I'm sure all of our viewers are based on, you know, you are been nominated for an Emmy, a uh, CDG World Award, you know, the world, Ooh. like, oh, so, so huge congratulations Thank to that. You. And our viewers cannot wait to see what you do next. Um, can we find you on social media? Is Do you have Instagram? Yeah. Anything? I am a modern gal. You can Love it. Uh, um website is Christine Clark Design. Um and then I also I'm very present on Instagram. Um okay. also Christine Clark Design. Great. Perfect. We'll definitely well, I share that. my little uh-huh. secrets with you there. Oh, <laughs> so excited. I'm yes. gonna go stalk you. That'd be yes. great. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on to the show for us. And thank you again to Western Costume Company for sponsoring us. Um And we will definitely talk with you soon. And um, good luck with everything that you do. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time, Christine.